Welcome to the, the closing lecture of the Monterey Summer Symposium on Russia 2020. Um, first, I just wanted to go over some quick ground rules. Uh, we are going to keep all the participants muted uh, until the Q&A, at which time the MSSR fellows and those first five people who signed up for this lecture will be unmuted and will be allowed to ask a question. I'll moderate the question and answer session as usual. Um, Mr. Posner will lecture for about an hour and then we will open it up for about 30 minutes of question and answer. So again, uh, welcome to the closing lecture of the Monterey Summer Symposium on Russia 2020. I can't believe it's already been six weeks. For those of you who have been following the symposium uh, this summer via our newsletter or our social media, have joined us and have joined us maybe for the first time, the Monterey Summer Symposium on Russia is the brainchild of Anna Borisovna Vasilyeva, who is the director of the Graduate Initiative in Russian Studies at the Middlebury Institute of International Studies at Monterey in California. It is her vision to expose 12 of the best and brightest young Russia scholars to an interdisciplinary curriculum taught by leading experts on international relations, diplomacy, nuclear nonproliferation, economics, cyber warfare, and Russian literature and the arts. Over the past five weeks, plus an optional elective module week that happened before the beginning of the seminar, our fellows and experts have been using different analytical approaches to gain a deeper understanding of Russia's behavior and have been exploring alternative strategies for conducting a more pragmatic and constructive Russia-related discourse. We would of course like to recognize the generous support of the Carnegie Corporation of New York, without which our program would not be possible, as well as the support of the Middlebury Institute of International Studies at Monterey. Of course, due to the pandemic, we've been conducting the symposium online this year. And though most would have probably preferred to be taking in the coastal beauty of Monterey, California, our online format has allowed the fellows direct access to many more experts than would have been possible in person. One such expert, who is definitely not a stranger to the Middlebury Institute for International Studies at Monterey, having visited more than once to lecture on many different topics, is Vladimir Posner. We are honored to welcome him to our virtual stage for the second time this summer. Mr. Posner is a veteran journalist, a best-selling author, and a documentary filmmaker. He is the host of the top-rated weekly current affairs program on Channel One, which is Russia's largest television network. Mr. Posner has won several multiple, multiple Soviet, Russian, and American awards, including three Emmy certificates, 10 TEFI awards, and several international awards. He is internationally recognized and ranks among the most respected people in the television profession in Russia today. The topic of Mr. Posner's presentation today will be the present state of Russian-American relations, how and why we got here, and is there a way out? So please join me in welcoming Mr. Posner to our stage. Thank you so very much. And this is where the applause would happen if this were in person. <laughs> Okay. Well, we can do that virtually too. <laughs> Don't have to do that. Thank you very, very much. Um, I believe I first spoke to you uh, just about a month ago. I think it was on the 23rd of June. And to be to completely frank, um, ever since then, I've been giving a lot of thought as to what I would say uh, when I speak on the last day. Uh, in fact, I've been racking my brains to, to figure out what I really want to say and what I should say. And because of that, I changed the topic of my talk twice, for which I beg to be forgiven because that certainly caused problems, I'm sure. Um, as Gerald has said, I'm supposed to speak for an hour. I don't know if I will. Um, maybe it'll be an hour, maybe it'll be slightly less. What I'm really hoping for is uh, an exchange with all of you, questions from you, um, questions that hopefully I can answer. If I can't, I'll just go ahead and say so. Um, I'd like to start off with a quote. Today, free and democratic Russia is extending its hand of friendship. 
to the people of America. Acting on the will of the Russian people, I am inviting you, and through you, the people of the United States, to join us in partnership in the quest for freedom and justice in the 21st century. Those words belong to President Boris Yeltsin. He was then addressing a joint meeting of the United States Congress. His words were greeted with cries of Boris, Boris, by one and all, both Republicans and Democrats. And today when you read those words, you find it difficult to believe that that was actually then the case. Today, it just is not possible to imagine a Russian leader being invited to a joint meeting of Congress and being met with that kind of attitude. After more than 40 years of Cold War with ICBMs and other weapons of mass destruction targeted at multiple cities, in each other's countries. A huge window of opportunity opened back then. We had escaped nuclear disaster. As General George Lee Butler, the head of the US Strategic Command, responsible for all of America's nuclear weapons during the administration of President George H.W. Bush put it in his memoir, Uncommon Cause. We escaped the Cold War without a nuclear holocaust by some combination of skill, luck, and divine intervention, and I suspect the latter in the greatest proportion. Today, I think it's fair to say that we're not only back to square one, but we are even further back. We're kind of minus square one or two, or three. And not only because of the weapons of mass destruction that both countries have developed and perfected over these years, weapons that are far more powerful and far more dangerous than the ones that existed before, but also and especially because the relations between our two countries have deteriorated to a level much greater than any time during the Cold War. I think this is something we should just pause for a minute to think about. At no time during the Cold War, including the Cuban Missile Crisis, was the relationship between the two countries as bad as it is today. And what I propose to examine with you is how and why this happened. And I also think we owe it to ourselves to suggest how to get out of this situation that poses an existential threat to both of our countries. I have absolutely no intention and much less desire to look for a culprit, to lay the blame at any doorstep. Not only because the blame is mutual, but because that would be an exercise in futility. It leads absolutely nowhere. And that's what we've been doing for years and years and years. If I dwell more on the American role when I speak today, it's only because I'm speaking to Americans, basically. basically. If I were speaking to Russians, I would of course dwell more on the Russian role in having created this situation. I think we should look back a bit to understand why we think what we think and why the attitudes that we have today exist because they didn't come out of nowhere. With the Bolshevik Revolution of 1917, Soviet Russia, first Soviet Russia, and then the Soviet Union was seen by the United States as a dire threat and may I say, rightly so. After all, 
the Soviet Union aspired to develop a communist system, not only in its own country, but it also set the goal of spreading that system worldwide, declaring capitalism its mortal enemy. And since the leading capitalist country was the United States, the face-off, the confrontation between the USSR and the USA became inev inevitable. This affected both foreign and domestic policy in both countries. In the USSR, it ultimately led to what I would call draconian, sometimes bordering on terrorist uh, measures against so-called enemies of the people. Ultimately, this led to the creation of the infamous Gulag. This led to the death of and incarceration of hundreds of thousands of absolutely innocent people. Insofar as the United States is concerned, it led to something that became called the Red Scare, a refusal to acknowledge the existence of the Soviet Union, and much later, to McCarthyism. When Hitler came to power in Germany, Western policy banked on the hope that fascist Germany would attack communist Russia. And when it did, future United States President Harry S. Truman, then a senator from Missouri, made the following statement. You may have heard it, but I'll repeat it anyway. He said, if we see that Germany is winning, we ought to help Russia. And if we see Russia is winning, we ought to help Germany. And that way, let them kill as many as possible. Although I don't want to see Hitler victorious under any circumstances. That gives you an idea of what the actual view of each other was. It is true that World War II brought us together as allies, but that partnership was short, short-lived, I might say. The theoretical fear on the part of the West and the United States in particular of the spread of communism became a reality. On March 5th, 1946, less than a year after the end of World War II, speaking in Fulton, Missouri, Winston Churchill said the following, from Stettin in the Baltic to Trieste in the Adriatic, an iron curtain has descended across the continent. Behind that line lie all the capitals of the ancient states of Central and Eastern Europe. Warsaw, Berlin, Prague, Vienna, Budapest, Belgrade, Bucharest, and Sofia. All these famous cities and the population around them lie in what I must call the Soviet sphere. And all are subject in one form or another not only to Soviet influence, but to a very high, and in many cases, increasing measure of control from Moscow. I think it's fair to say that that was the birth of the Cold War. And I would add, at least in my own view, that the virtual occupation of those countries by the Soviet Union was perhaps uh, one of the most tragic mistakes, policy mistakes, that that country ever made. In July 1947, in the issue published on that month of Foreign Affairs, American diplomat George F. Kennan, probably one of the most outstanding 
diplomats of the United States in the 20th century. He wrote that the United States should pursue, and I'm quoting him, a long-term patient, but firm and vigilant containment of Russian expansive tendencies in the hope that the regime would mellow or collapse. That was a policy, the policy of containment that became the basic American policy vis-a-vis -vis the Soviet Union. In the following years, uh, the world witnessed the Korean War the, that split that peninsula into two different countries, one communist, the other not. That was followed by China becoming a communist country, and slightly later, Cuba and Vietnam. Apprehension, uh, apprehensive of a possible aggression by the Soviet Union, the West, led by the United States, created NATO, the North Atlantic Treaty Organization, a military and political bloc that was followed by the creation of the Warsaw Pact. To my view, a bogus organization that was created by the Soviet Union in answer, supposedly, to NATO. It was its version, if you will, of NATO. The, the two sides never actually experienced military conflict, but they came very, very close. And of course, the Cuban crisis is perhaps uh, the most telling example of that, but there were many other instances, uh, some of which we know about and others of which are, st which are still not really known at all, when because of technical glitches, misunderstanding the flight of birds, um, the, uh, the, the nuclear systems of both sides uh, were on hair trigger and anything could have gone wrong, wrong at that point. We were very, very lucky that nothing happened. Uh, but uh, that did not stop none of those issues, none of those uh, terrifying moments really changed policy on either side. Um, we did fight each other, but by proxy. We fought in Vietnam. We fought in Afghanistan. And interestingly enough, neither side won. Both lost. Which should have taught us a lesson, but it really didn't. We went on producing our weapons of mass destruction. And when I say our, I'm speaking of both countries. Now, looking back over that history, we must understand that there were reasons for mutual fear and distrust. And we must keep in mind that for nearly 80 years, Russia and America were mortal enemies. That means that nearly four generations of people in both countries, Americans and Russians, grew up under circumstances that could not but affect their way of thinking, their understanding, their attitudes towards each other. This was inevitable. Nothing could be done about that. And so when even today we speak to people about each other's countries and we get negative responses, that is the result of those many, many years of confrontation. And it's almost an automatic knee-jerk reaction. Hardly anyone really expected the radical changes that occurred when Mikhail Gorbachev came to power, much less the collapse of the Soviet Union only a few years later. 
This was a total surprise, not only to the West, but to a very large degree to the Soviet people themselves. Now, what is important to keep in mind is how that event, which by the way, President Putin called, I believe, a world tragedy, um, was seen by the people in both countries. The reason Putin, of course, called it a tragedy was because something like 25 million Russians found themselves living abroad. They had been living in one country called the USSR, which became 15 different countries. And in those 14 other countries that were not Russia proper, there were 25 million Russians who found themselves foreigners. It's hard to imagine, but it, you could try by imagining the falling apart of the United States. And suddenly you say, I'm no longer American. I'm, what am I, Texan or, or something like that? It's that type of situation. But essentially what Russians felt after the collapse of communism was, we did it, we did it. And you should be grateful to us that we did it. And um, you should take us into your arms, if you will, and accept us now as part of the world community. And you know, that's pretty much what Yeltsin was saying when, when I quoted his words to the United States Congress. We now are, we're offering to be partners. That's a key word in that partners means equals. And we're offering to do this together, to see to it that all the things that have gone wrong in this world to a very large degree because of us, because of our confrontation, because of what we've been doing, those things can be righted so that in the 21st century, people will live a safer, uh, positive and happy life. Now, in that same year of 1992, that Yeltsin addressed the United States Congress, a man by the name of Paul Wolfowitz, who was under, under Secretary of Defense for Policy, produced a document that came to be called the Wolfowitz Doctrine. It was not intended for public um, release, but it was leaked to the New York Times on March 7th, 1992. Um, and what is not often mentioned, uh, but worth uh, keeping an eye on, was that that document played, has played, and continues to play a role in US policy vis-a-vis -vis Russia. Um, I think it's uh, at this point important to note that this window of opportunity that was presented by Boris Yeltsin um, offered two ways, if you will, of looking at Russia proper, this new country that appeared as a result of the collapse of the Soviet Union. What kind of a country, one should have asked themselves back then, should this become? What kind of a country would we like to see it be? Will it ever get back on its feet again? And if it does, what's it going to be like? Is it going to be threatening? Or is it going to be a partner? And there were a lot of arguments about that uh, in the United States at a very high level. There were those who said, yes, Russia ultimately will come back. And so we should care about 
what kind of a country it's going to be when it does come back. And there were others who said, no, it's all over. Russia will now be a secondary, a third rate country, a country that cannot really in any way or will not really in any way affect the rest of the world. A small, perhaps not small because it's physically still very large, but with no real power. And there were some who said, and that's the way it should be. And the Wolfowitz Doctrine said precisely that, among many, many other things, because the Wolfowitz Doctrine was about policy in general, not just as a V, Russia. Well, uh, it was a policy that one could call presented by Mr. Wolfowitz of unilateralism. Uh, preemptive military uh, action, American supremacy. America, with the downfall of the Soviet Union, had automatically become the only superpower. And that was, according to Mr. Wolfowitz, the way it should be and the way it should remain and in, under no conditions should that change. That was met with a lot of criticism, criticism in the United States. Uh, I remember that um, later on, when the Wolfowitz Doctrine became part of the Bush Doctrine, Senator uh, Edward Kennedy said that it was a call for 21st century American imperialism that no other nation can or should accept. That was one view. Of course, there were many others. Crucially important, um, Russia did not see the end of the Cold War as a defeat, but it rather as an opportunity to become part of the international community. Whereas the United States saw it as a victory and as opening the way to American supremacy. Not all people, but certainly a lot of the people who were decision makers. And if we look for the real reason for why we stand where we are today, not the different acts, not the different events, not the different speeches that were made on both sides, but at the real heart of the issue. Um, I think we'll see something that perhaps we don't think about very often. Thomas Graham, who I believe spoke to you more than once during the seminar, wrote the following. At the core of Russian identity is the deeply held belief that Russia must be a great power and that it must be recognized as such. Ever since Peter the Great brought Russia into Europe at the beginning of the 18th century, the belief in Russia's predestined role in the world has informed Russian thinking and action. I think Mr. Graham hit the nail right on the head. The Russian people have never doubted the fact that theirs is a great country, a country that plays and must play a highly important role in the world, that it is secondary to no other country. And that is precisely what the wealth of its doctrine refuses to take into account. I'm not at this point trying to paint a negative picture of Mr. Wolfowitz or of those who accepted his view. But what I'm trying to point out is that the decision that Russia was gone, would not, would not come back would remain a relatively unimportant country was a great mistake. 
just as the Russian decision to move into Eastern Europe and to kind of force its system on those countries was a great mistake. It took a long time for the mistake to come back and hit them, but it did. It did. And if the relationship today between Russia and those countries is far worse than with any other country that Russia never did occupy, be it France, Germany, Spain, Italy, you name it, it's precisely because of what happened back then. The decision to ignore the possibility of Russia coming back, I repeat, was a great mistake. Uh, at the, at the uh, uh, At best, uh, Russia was seen as a regional power. That was the way it was supposed to be. And one can only marvel at the, uh, the lack of, of farsightedness, if you will, uh, at the adoption of a policy that would eventually lead to a new Cold War. And make no mistake about this, there is a Cold War now. People will tell you, well, it's a different situation. Yes, it is. Because the Cold War was basically a war of ideology, of two different philosophies, of two basically different views of what society should be like. Today, it's not a question of ideology. It's a different issue. But it's a Cold War, and hopefully it's going to stay cold. Although I have serious, serious doubts about what might happen in the not too distant future. Um, this, this policy, this view that worked its way gradually into American policy uh, was based on, in my opinion, misunderstanding and even ignorance. A mere seven years after that speech before the United States Congress, because of the bombing of Serbia by NATO without UN support, the acknowledgement of Kosovo, the changing of frontiers, which was not supposed to happen after World War II, the enlargement of NATO, which had been promised not to happen, because of all those things, that same man, Boris Yeltsin, furiously said, Russia isn't Haiti, and we won't be treated as though we were. I don't like it when the United States flaunts its superiority. Russia will rise again. I repeat, Russia will rise again. And not only, he added, because Russia was a nuclear power, but also because of our economy, our culture, our spiritual power. Those words he spoke in 1999, shortly before resigning, resigning his presidency, and basically appointing Vladimir Putin. Um, may I remind you that initially Putin's presidency promised improvement of U.S.-Russian relations. He was the first foreign leader to speak out about what happened on 9-11 and to offer his help. Uh, then in May 2002, there was a U.S.-Russian summit in Moscow and St. Petersburg. Um, and a joint declaration was issued proposing a strategic partnership in which the two countries would move together as, and work together as equals. Terribly important point, as equals. And soon after that, Russia and NATO signed an accord entitled NATO-Russian 
relations and new quality. They created a NATO-Russia uh, organization, if you will, or council. Again, there was another window of opportunity that opened up. And that, that window was slammed shut by the Orange Revolution in Ukraine in 2004. Now, uh, Russia, in particular, Mr. Putin, felt that the United States played a key role in orchestrating that revolution. There can be a lot of arguments about whether or not that's true. After I've deeply studied that, that issue, I do think that the United States was very active in promoting and helping that revolution take place. And let's not forget, Ukraine is on Russia's border and it's a large border. And the thought that if Ukraine went west and became a member of NATO, then NATO would find itself, or rather Russia would find NATO on its border. And since NATO was seen by the Russian side as a military threat, Russia would not allow that to happen. And I believe that that, that was really the breaking point. Although officially, the breaking point came later. That came later. It came in Munich in February of 2007 uh, at the Munich Security Conference. Um, there are many, many issues that came up there that are worth exploring. Uh, I would say things that have affected international policy and continue to do so to the present day. But I would like to focus your attention on just one issue. What President Putin referred to as the unipolar world. Here's what he said. The history of humanity has gone through unipolar periods and seen aspiration to world supremacy. However, what is a unipolar world? However, one might embellish this term. At the end of the day, it refers to one type of situation, namely one center of authority, one center of force, one center of decision-making. It is a world in which there is one master, one sovereign. And at the end of the day, this is pernicious, not only for all those within that system, but also for the sovereign itself, because it destroys itself from within. And he added, this certainly has nothing in common with democracy, because as you know, democracy is the power of the majority in light of the interests and opinion of the minority. I consider that the unipolar world, the unipolar model is not only unacceptable, but also impossible in today's world. From that point on, and I would recommend that you look it up and, and, and if you will study what happened afterwards. From that point on, President Putin was seen, portrayed as dangerous, evil, and actually unacceptable. I could give you endless quotes uh, about what was said during the following years about Putin. And um, it will be said that, well, that was for different reasons because he did this or he did that, or he uh, said this or he said that. 
But in fact, the reason is that Mr. Putin refused to accept to accept American leadership. That is really at the basis of the change or of the the present, let me put it this way, of the, the, the present relationship. As I said, in this particular talk, I dwell more on the American side, simply because I am speaking to Americans, basically. Uh, but I'm not in any way absolving the Russian side as if the Russians were the, were the victims. Russia played its negative role. And if you want to ask me about that later on, I'm happy to, to dwell on that. But this particular issue, recalling what Thomas Graham said about the core of Russian identity, we are a great country. And if you do not accept that, if you do not accept us as equals, then there is no way that we can be partners. Of course, uh, so that in a nutshell is what happened. The refusal of Russia to accept American world leadership. And of course, followed by the furious anti-Putin, anti-Russia reaction, because for some strange reason, Putin and Russia are put together in one, as if it were just one unit. And that has led, in my opinion, uh, to what underlies the situation we're in today, that have bordered on aggression and that we have witnessed since then. Of course, now, with the, uh, the, the, the aggression I'm speaking about is Ukraine, Crimea, Syria, Lebanon, Iraq, Afghanistan, so on. Um, on the cover of the first issue of the Bulletin of Atomic Scientists, which was published in June 1947, there first appeared a drawing of what came to be called the doomsday clock. And on that, in that, draw, on that drawing, the minute hand was set at seven minutes to midnight. Midnight being nuclear war, nuclear catastrophe. Since then, that minute hand has been moved 24 times. The further back, the further back it ever was from midnight was 17 minutes and the closest it ever was to midnight was 100 seconds. And that happened this year in 2020. It's the closest that that minute hand ever came to midnight. Um, I'd like to tell you a story that, that concerns me personally. I have a grandson who was born and grew up in Germany. My daughter um, married a German, moved to Germany, and she's been living there now for 30 years. And so he was born there. He's now 25. And many years ago, I visited him in Berlin. I think he was about 10 or 11. And I asked him, Nicholas, tell me, what do they teach you in school about Hitler, about Nazi Germany? What do they tell you? And he said, you know, they tell us it's not just Hitler who was to blame. And it's not just the Nazi party. It's the German people. Because the German people supported Hitler and supported the Nazi party. And I must tell you, I was, I was shocked because I thought, in what other country would they teach something like that? 
that the people are to blame for what their governments do. But the more I've thought about that, the more I think it's true. I think ultimately we're the ones who vote for, support our governments. And so when I think of the situation we have today, a situation that is really, really dangerous, and for some reason we don't protest. You don't in America, and we don't in Russia. We don't demand that our government stop producing those weapons of mass destruction. You know, not that many years ago, back in the 1980s, there were such protests. Thousands of people, not in the Soviet Union, obviously, which being a totalitarian country would never have allowed its people into the streets, but all over the world, not so much in America, but certainly in Europe, there were huge demonstrations um, against the development of nuclear weapons. There are none anymore. What's going, you have protests now in the United States on the issue of Black Lives Matter, which is very important, but the fate of the world matters just as much, doesn't it? And yet somehow, we refuse to think about that. We do not demand that our governments cease producing these weapons of mass destruction, cut back on them seriously. We don't do that. And ultimately, if some catastrophe were to happen, we would be the ones to blame. We wouldn't, be a lot, we wouldn't be around very long, I suspect, but nonetheless, we would be the ones responsible because we did not stand up and did not say stop. We should be demanding that President Trump and President Putin meet and find a way to stop what's going on, that both overcome whatever distrust, whatever dislike, and whatever else sets them apart, because they owe it to us. They owe it to our lives, to our children, to our grandchildren. It seems to me that we wait for someone else to do this. So, as I finish this rambling talk of mine. I think we should give a lot of thought to the present situation. I think we should forget about accusing each other of different things that we may have done, but they are of no importance when we think of the fate of civilization. And that's what we're talking about. The way things stand today, I think a, an accidental nuclear exchange is a reality. And I think, I think that when you are not far away from a presidential election, you should be demanding that the president and Mr. Biden speak much more about the nuclear issue than about what they're talking now. Anyway, that's, uh, that's what I wanted to say. That's my, my feeling. I've now been speaking for about 50 minutes, so it's not quite an hour. So you'll forgive me for that, I hope. And uh, I'm more than happy to answer your questions.